In Africa, we have a long history of people in power behaving badly, behaving as if there's no tomorrow, behaving as if their lives and what they do when they have this power will not be required to stand the test of time, as if it does not matter how history will look at them. This is indeed very short-sighted. Because you leave behind people who will carry your name. Yeah, and they'll continue living on this earth hundreds of years after you're gone. And this is why some people change their names. Folks, a good name is much better than all the money in the world. Indeed, the two cannot be compared. And I've seen this playing out in my very own life. On a few instances, People have recognized my second name and everything has changed. In fact, on one occasion, I was introduced and it made me start thinking very deeply yeah, about the people I leave behind and how the world will accept them or take them long after I'm gone. What would you rather be? The son of Idi Amin Dada, former Ugandan dictator? Or the son of Kenneth Matiba, or Tom Boyer, or Dedan Kimathi. You may not have a lot of money, but your second name can do some things for you that all the money in the world can never do for you. Anyway, today I have a real treat for you. An excerpt from my book, Dark Secrets of the Kenyan Presidency. And not just any section of the book, a very dramatic section, a movie. Enjoy as we remind ourselves to always, forever, only do things that can stand the test of time. Enjoy. Welcome to these excerpts from my book, Dark Secrets of the Kenyan Presidency. I think by far the most popular book I've ever written. Uh, this is just a section of the book, the new revised uh, version, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Now, the Luo community have been known to produce opportunistic strikers, legendary opportunistic strikers. These are strikers who can smell a goal, yeah, and produce actually a goal from nothing. I'm thinking of names like uh, Peter Dow, or they used to call him Peter Dow, a very sensational striker. Anyway, the Lua have also produced opportunistic politicians and people have not been able to look at them this way before. I'm talking about, of course, Tom Boyer, who took advantage of an opportunity and turned it into something great. But there's another less known figure, who although was not a politician, played politics marvelously and beautifully to be able to achieve quite a lot. Well, selfish, selfishly so, but I think his life is very interesting to look at. And this is of course a man who was called Hezekiah Oyugi. At the height of his power, Hezekiah Oyugi used to have ministers, cabinet ministers, kneeling down before him. And yet he was nothing more than a permanent secretary. Actually a permanent secretary uh, who was previously a DO, DO, DC, PC, and then permanent secretary. Somebody who rose from very humble beginnings, but took full advantage of the opportunities that were before him. An extremely intelligent man, as we shall learn shortly. It is believed that uh, Ezekiel Yugi developed his close relationship with uh, President Moy at that time, the vice president during his tenure as Nakuru DC. For younger Kenyans, DC means district commissioner. Nakuru was Moe's home district. 
and uh, it was also the place where the Kiambu mafia operated in extensively yeah now as DC of Nakuru Oyugi was, also, was able to get a lot of information and he passed this information on to Moi now credit has to be given to Oyugi because nobody ever guessed that one day humble Vice President Moy would ever rise to be president of the country. Yes, he was the vice president, but it was clear that the Kiambu Mafia were never going to allow him to step into the shoes of Jomo Kenyatta. Indeed, even the Kiambu Mafia had started a change the constitution uh, movement and uh, had gotten the support of many powerful politicians. The whole idea was to change the constitution so that Moy did not ascend to the presidency automatically. It is believed that it was from Oyugi that Moi learned of an assassination plot that had been planned for him. You see, after the change, the constitutional movement uh, fell, uh, went belly up, mainly because it received no support from Jomo Kenyatta. Uh, the Kiambu Mafia hatched a plan to ensure that Moi would never ascend to the presidency. And their plan was to assassinate him in the event of Kenyatta's death to assassinate Moi. It is believed that Moi learned the, of this from Oyugi. Now Oyugi rose very rapidly after the death of President Kenyatta, very rapidly up the ranks. And the main reason was the role he played in not only getting Moi safely to Nairobi, but looking after his entire security and uh, organizing a plan that would bypass the Kiambu Mafia, who had their tentacles everywhere, in the security forces, in the police, and so on. Actually, on the death of Kenyatta, Charles Njonjo, who was then the Attorney General AG, dispatched a helicopter to search for Moy. What had happened is that they had tried to raise him on foot, but it was not reachable. Now, the interesting and fascinating thing is that once the helicopter had landed on uh, Moy's farm, he did not come back to Nairobi with him. Very interesting. Instead, it was sent back with the message that Moy would proceed to Nairobi immediately. But Moy did not do that. He made his way back to Nakuru, where he met up with Oyugi, who at that time was not even aware that Kenyatta was normal. Oyugi then discreetly drove Moy to Nairobi. We have already seen how Moy got back to Nairobi in the boot of an old Peugeot 404. Oyugi is the one who drove that vehicle. It was a bizarre way for the President of the Republic of Kenya to get to Nairobi from Nakuru. But it was necessary under the circumstances. It was necessary to keep him alive. It is this entire operation which Oyugi performed, of course endangering his own life greatly, that enabled Oyugi to rise up to a situation where he was untouchable in the Moi government. Indeed, he was the only non Kalenjin who was untouchable in the inner Moi circle. quite a story. <laughs> now, something very interesting happened yesterday on our Telegram platform. Somebody accused me of deliberately telling lies. And somebody else who knows me very well, who is also a member of the forum, shot me an email and told me, Chris, hiyo ilikuwa matusi. And they told me that I'm very naive if I cannot recognize an insult. Because they said this person should realize what Chris Kumekucha has suffered over the years for seeking the truth and for trying to reveal the truth. I called them back and told them to lose a ball. To lose a ball. <laughs> Relax. Some people started following Kumekucha two months ago, three months ago. You can't compare yourself to them. How? Yeah. Give them the leeway. 
yeah, to express their views. Because as far as I'm concerned, as long as I continue to try my very best to do only things that will stand the test of time, then I have nothing to worry about. Not even insults. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekucha.